do a serious one. Yeah, yeah. So joining you live from the World Championship 2023 in Barcelona, the Living Legend Podcast. big thing in TCG and Wargaming is now live on Kickstarter. What? Where is it? I need to see it. Let me have it. <laughs> I've already got my copy. You can find it on GrimPath.com or on Kickstarter right now. Good. Okay. How's it going, everyone? And welcome back to the Living Legends Podcast, your weekly source of flesh and blood Tom Foolery, all aspects of the flesh and blood trading card game. My name is Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue, and today I am joined, as usual, by my two lovely co hosts, As and Bill. Bill, how are you doing today, my friend? You know what? Thank you for asking. I'm doing pretty good, uh, all things considered. It is, uh, it's been a little bit colder in Winnipeg than it has been for the rest of this winter, but. That also is not saying much. Uh, we have had very <laughs> right. tropical climates compared to what we're usually used to. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit colder, but um, as you can see, I'm bundled up. I got a nice flannel on, and uh, we're we're surviving. We are, in fact, uh, gaming, as some might say. Gaming. <laughs> I was gonna say flannel is the uh, Canadian tuxedo, but isn't that a jean jacket? I think it is. It is all denim. It is a jean yeah. jacket with a with a oh, jean really? shirt and jeans. Yes, that yeah. is the Canadian tuxedo. Good old Canadian tuxedo, and uh, um, someone who would wear a Canadian tuxedo. We have As from Go Again Gaming. How you doing, wow, As? Like, such a great excellent segue. segue. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> Because I because I, I've been I've been told a few times uh, that um, I could pass as a Canadian, especially with the mustache and the denim jacket. Um, so uh, so yeah, um, I'm doing well. Uh, and actually, speaking of weather and stuff, I've got like a little heated blanket on beneath me. Uh, so it's nice. nice little for the for the visual viewers out there. You can see it's got nice little nice little fur layer here and insulated layer there. So it's nice. It's switched on. Uh, so it's uh, so it's great for the win- for the winter and colder months, which we are still experiencing in the UK at the moment. It's March, beginning of March, so we've still got a little bit of cold to get through. But yeah, I mean, um, we're also going to be getting getting through some cold flesh and blood stuff today because there isn't much going on. <laughs> it's a little on the, the the more tepid side, I would say. Right now, we don't have a lot of. Uh... Uh, fiery news uh we have some things to talk about and potentially just some like good general discussions but um before we get to that i do want to say a little word from our sponsor today a huge shout out to grim path for sponsoring another uh, video or another episode of the living legends podcast Uh, grim path is a war game tcg hybrid that is currently on kickstarter i think it is a really really fun game i personally played it myself i think as has played it as well and um, I think it fits a really cool niche where if you've always wanted to get into war games but never, you know, pulled the trigger or if you just were looking for like a, a fun little side game to play when you're playing your flesh and blood, I think Grim Path really fits that 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 kind of like niche, right? Uh, it's a game that you can play as a supplemental to whatever else you're doing. And there's a lot of really cool consumer and player friendly things that the game has going for it. Like you don't have to use their minis. It's a war game, but you can use your own minis, right? If you already have minis, you can use them. Um, and it's a really fun, yeah. like just kind of like customizable experience. So, a uh, huge shout out to Grim Path. Uh, we will we will have links to their Kickstarter uh, down below. I think it's super fun, and it is one of my most anticipated games of the year. Uh, not just trading card games, just games in general, because personally, it feels more like a war game to me than a TCG. Because every turn, I'm always thinking about what I'm going to do with my minis. A little bit less about what I'm doing with my cards. More like what the cards can do to supplement what I'm doing with my minis. Um, like think yeah. of it like um um it's kind of like marvel midnight suns if anyone knows what that is right where you have your units and then you have your hand of cards and then you play the cards and then your units do what your cards do it's really close to like that that kind of vibe so um, that's a cool that's a cool comparison actually i actually um i did download that game but i downloaded it for an old pc and it didn't really work very well so i do need to look at that game again but yeah that's, that's definitely a good comparison between it from what i played from the tutorial um but yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, I haven't played it yet, but my me and my friend are going to be uh, trying to do that very very soon and make some videos on it. So stay tuned. But yeah, thanks for Dave for sponsoring this video. Love yeah. your job. Yeah. So shout out to them. Check them out. Links in the description down below. And now back to your regularly scheduled flesh and blood talkery. <laughs> though though I though we did mention there's not a ton of like new exciting things to talk about that we have come up 
with some uh, some some topics. Before we do that, I guess we can go over our weeks in Flesh and Blood. Here, I'll tell you mine. Uh, I don't really have a week in Flesh and Blood, so that's about it. I, I did uh, Grand Archive Nationals uh, coverage, and I'll, I'll probably save that for maybe the, uh, the Arsenal steps. So uh, with that said, I'm going to yeah. go ahead and, and pass the baton immediately on over to... Uh, let, let's go to Az first, because I think Az has a, a little bit more robust, because you have the league that's kind of going on right now, right? That's right, yeah, the league that means nothing. Um, so for the people that are watching this uh, right now... All of the week one matches are now on uh, Go Again Gaming. Um, so uh, w- the week two matches have already been played as well, uh, but they're due to come out not this week, but next week. And I think, Bill, you're going to be doing some stuff for that, aren't you? <laughs> I am, actually. That's uh, that's my plan for tomorrow, is uh, to meet up with my, my good friend and uh, flesh and blood player uh, extraordinaire, uh, Jay, shout out Jay. Apparently, he has been trying desperately to catch up on our uh, on our backlog of videos. And uh, the last time he talked to me, he said that he was, uh, I think, in January. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice. And then he messaged me this morning and said that he just caught up on the most recent episode. So welcome back, Jay. Oh, hello. <laughs> nice. Um, back. But yeah, Zen State so Fab be, on YouTube. <laughs> Zen State Fab on YouTube. He's a good friend of mine, very talented altar artist as well. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be going over to his place and we're going to be hanging out and commentating over, uh, I believe, a game, maybe multiple. There's quite, um, a, few, there's quite a few games on there. So uh, I'll, give, I'll give you the lowdown on what your choices are. You can do all of them if you want, just depending on how much time you've got. But there are a few choices. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an insight as to what you can come to expect from this league that means nothing. And if you don't do all of them, then you know me and Kel can maybe do a few other ones. Uh, but there are five games to choose from, Bill. Um, Ooh. Ooh. So you can have a look at these. Uh, so the first first one is Azalea versus Kasai. We've already had that being played on the league that means uh, nothing. Is it dif- that was, uh, uh, different uh, players this time? Yeah, that's me and Steven, Dear Mamada. Oh, okay. Game. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'm playing Azalea, he's playing Kasai. Then we also have uh, Dorinthia versus Dromai, which is a very interesting game. Dorinthia versus Dromai. I thought it would be very Dromai favoured, but I was well. In that. <laughs> so Dorinthia can get those those on hits onto the the dragons. Yeah, exactly. Um, and when I spoke to Steven about it, because obviously I was playing with him, you know, with the Azalea versus Kasai, he he said that it's a very, very different, obviously Kasai and Dor- Dor- Dory are very different, aren't they? Because Dory has incremental value, whereas Kasai is more sort of consistent. Um, so if Dorinthia can get those counters on her sword, it just becomes harder and harder for the opponent to deal with it. Um and I guess with when you're when you're a warrior attacking into allies, it's free on hits because the, you can't block for an ally. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's also an interesting game. I'm not going to spoil it, but it was interesting. Ma- uh, interesting match. Then we have a Kasai versus Prism Awakener of Soul game. Nice. Um, so a lot of illusionist games for you to pick from here, Bill. Uh, then yeah. we have a Ko versus Olympia. And then Reinar versus Viserai. Um, so there's quite a few matchups on there. And as you can come to expect, the Spike Feeders, Bill from the Spike Feeders, and Jay, regular uh, regular Spike Feeder, basically, um, are going to be doing that. So obviously you've you got free reign as to what you want to choose, but those are the five ones that you can choose from, essentially. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward um, to it. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. I'm looking forward to to getting the videos back and getting it on getting it online because uh, you were great at casting games when we did it on the on the on the Dex was it Dex and Drafts show wasn't it? The, it was yeah. the uh, the coaxing. That's it. Yeah, that was good fun. All three of us doing that, wasn't it? Um, yeah, that was a really good time. Yeah, that was, that was a wild. That was a wild one. Yeah, it was a wild. One. Just like in the Discord call, in between rounds and stuff, just chatting, you know, to to, to everybody that was watching. Um, yeah, cool. I love I love doing live stuff. It's good fun. You always have to be. That's, that's the thing about being a content creator, right? If you're live, you always have to be quote unquote on. You know, you have to always be performing, and it is hard to do that sometimes. But with a podcast, you can be a little bit more laid back, uh, which is nice. Um, yeah, so uh, so that was my that was my week in Flash and Blood. There's a lot of games coming out, but that sort of goes into what Bill's going to be doing as well. I expect this week. Um, but if you had anything else, any more Spike Feeders related stuff, Bill, that might be on the docket, by all means, let us know. 
Uh, I think the only other thing was uh, we enlisted the help of uh, another friend of the channel, Kaylee, uh, and I wanted to give her a shout out specifically. She uh, helped us sort of fix up uh, the box of regular decks that we have for the Goliath Gauntlet. Um, she oh, went yeah. in and uh, updated a bunch of them and uh, had a really cool idea for kind of like a uh, sort of ready to play box of decks where um, she was like, yeah, I'm going to put together these little index cards that sort of go with the hero hmm. that just give you like a very brief rundown of what the deck cares about. So the example that hmm. she gave me was Phi. So it was just this little card that said like, oh, your power card that you want to look for is like Art of War, because then that lets you go really wide. Um, there's a brief rundown of what the, the plan is for the, the deck in general. And then there was a little note that was like, your plan for Arcane Barrier uh, is just, it's a race, you're faster. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, cool. that's a really good idea. So um, yeah, I, I recently put together a, this has nothing to do with Flesh and Blood, but it does have to do with like a box set thing. Because I just had the idea of um, putting together like a, a commander pre-con battle box. And one, one of the things that I did is I, I kept the little pre-con fold out things that kind of gives you a little bit of lore about the commander and it shows you the deck list and tells you a little bit about the deck and i kept that in the battle box because i was like hey if i'm playing with someone who's never played before this is a good little thing that i can be like here this is what this yeah. weird sliver deck does if you don't know what the hell they are this is kind of like the lowdown on it so i think that's a really good idea yeah, yeah i think did they did they have something similar i think they, i remember them having something similar in the outsiders deck so i haven't had any I haven't opened any of the new decks since Outsiders, but in Outsiders, I think they had like a little. It was like a difficulty rating of how to how to play. I believe there was I, like a like. I don't remember if they had it for Outsiders. They definitely had it for Uprising. I remember that for oh, sure. Right. They might have gotten rid of all that for Outsiders because I remember out, the Outsiders decks really didn't have much special in them, and I know a lot of people were kind of um, uh, disappointed that they didn't have the full art heroes on them because the the older decks used to have like the full art heroes um right, yeah but I don't, I don't remember they might have had a difficulty rating maybe maybe yeah maybe it was on the box i don't know it's been a little while it's been about a year yeah, right I, I seem to remember some some product having a difficulty rating um for some reason the the immediate thing that comes to mind is valda but valda didn't have a deck no valda doesn't have uh, a deck so that, yeah I, so that's just I, sweet, i'm though. making something up on the spot um, but yeah, Valdo should have a deck, by the way. That's that's oh yeah, uh, that's just me. <laughs> Seismic surge tribal, absolutely. That, that's yeah. not just you. Uh, a lot of people would love a Valdo deck, I think. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember, but that is a, that is a great idea because obviously, with the with the decks that you know, obviously you've made uh, and she's made. Sorry, it's about the mm -hmm. um, it's about the the power cards and explaining the power cards. I think is a cool thing to do because if you're if you've got that in your hand, you know you can maybe take some damage from your opponent next turn to really play your power turn as such. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, and, that's uh, a yeah. It, it was it was just a really cool idea that she came up with, and uh, so I wanted to mm -hmm. shout her out for that specifically. Uh, thank you, Kaylee, for helping us. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it was. Um, it, it, it sort of builds into like how we want to introduce the decks anyway when we're playing in the Goliath Gauntlet. Like this is the generalized game plan of what this deck wants to do. So, you yeah. know, if uh, if I'm playing a deck that you know because I have to play a bunch of different ones, maybe I'm not super familiar with a specific style. It just mm -hmm. at least gives me a jumping off point to start talking about it and uh, or just to like refresh my memory to be like this is exactly how this one plays because. For me, I still remember back to when I wanted uh, Phi to be like a Phoenix Flame value engine, uh, and that is not how that deck plays. <laughs> yeah, if you if you take a look at the uh, the Phi decks from Worlds, they have like one Phoenix Flame, right? It's just the one. They don't even yeah. run like multiples. Yeah. Yeah, it is simply there uh, because it's a free card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because because you just get it. It's like part of his hero ability, right? So, mm -hmm. but but you never really need more than one. You never you never you're not doing like the we mentioned it like a week or two ago, but that uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one that lets you draw three cards. Yeah, Phoenix Phoenix form. Okay, uh, I, I was gonna I was gonna say that, but I was like I'm, I wasn't 100 percent sure if that was right. I think you're right. Though. Yeah, that's, I think that's the one. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of my favorite cards that I've gotten to to see the payoff for exactly one time, uh, and it was <laughs> sweet. Except it got immediately blocked. It got blocked. I was gonna say I I think oh, I've God. I think I've played it once and it was immediately like blocked. It was like a good block too. It was like a 
unmovable or something. It was just like, yeah, this isn't hitting no matter what. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It's like, oh, I have an ancestral empowerment in my hand. It's like, oh, well, it's not even a ninja card. Or I think it still is a draconic ninja card. But even then, plus one when you're getting blocked for seven is uh, not always going to get you there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you what, though. Um, the These these games I've been editing and watching, some of the some of the cards I've seen being played from heavy hitters have been ridiculous. And you, you might see them as well, Bill, but uh, Grains of Blood Spill has has had a lot of impact on the games I've watched for, for Warrior. Um, so that is massive, uh, just being able to sort of store resources because Warriors do tend to have a lot of extra resources floating around and blues mm-hmm. and stuff in their deck. So being able to sort of put those extra resources into grains and then have an even sort of more consistent turn next turn, whether that's drawing a card from the gold or just pl- paying for a Blade Runner or paying for like a Centauri Saber, if you haven't drawn a card that turn to make them free, yeah, grains mm-hmm. is pretty good, and blade flurry as well is another one that is extremely yes. good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, do you know what? Can you read out what what grains does for all of the uh, listeners out there? I can I can do blade flurry. That one's pretty easy, right? That that's just the uh, attack gets plus two, and then your next uh, your next attack gets plus two, right? Um, yeah, that's right. So it's, uh, yeah, so and it costs is, zero. Yeah, it's a reaction. Exactly. It's really it's yeah, really so sweet. And it, and it just scales so well with Dorinthia as well, mm-hmm. uh, which is mental uh but yeah grains of blood spell is the uh two block warrior equipment chest it's a legendary and it says uh temper as well so um when the combat chain closes if this was if this is defended put a mars encounter on it then if it has zero defense destroy it and it just says whenever a weapon attack you control hits you may pay one if you do create a, a vigor token um which is absolutely ridiculous i think and uh, if you mm-hmm. can if you can trigger that multiple times over the course of a game, you're getting so much, so much out of it. It's uh, it's pretty crazy, and I've just I've just been able to witness it recently. Um, so, and you will too if you go over to Go Again Gaming in the, over the next few weeks. You'll see Warriors just ab- abusing this card, uh, which is which is great to see. But if you're against it, you, it's uh, yeah, it's just that consistency, isn't it? The who, who would have thought getting a resource at the start of your turn through a vigor, you know, like a tunic esque line, is powerful. <laughs> So, yeah, it's very good. It's uh, it's just kind of ridiculous that um, like you're like the the thing that I immediately compared it to was um, was tectonic plating, and mm-hmm. uh, like because it blocks the same amount, kind of. Uh, I mean, there's it's a difference between temper and uh, and battle worn, but uh, battle worn was a mistake anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like you it, it's basically the same thing where you can bank uh, a resource but grains you can technically bank more than one uh which i think yep. is also crazy and it's in uh i would say it's it's in a, a class that cares equally as much as having one additional resource if not maybe slightly more mm-hmm. um because you can use it on like attack reactions uh because it is just straight up a resource and it's not just your guardian attack costs one less sort of thing um yeah, yeah. It's, you can use it for uh, like gold. You can use it for like anything. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty sweet. Yeah, you can. It feeds it feeds itself as well because you you get a vigor token. You can even use that resource that you've got to even just put that back into the grains again potentially mm-hmm. until you until you get until you get a turn which is actually making use of it more. Um, so it it can just that resource that you bank on it can just carry on going over and over essentially. Well, it does. If you if you if you use that resource, yeah, it does. So if you if you if you hit, you're gonna get a vigor, and then you're gonna spend that vigor no matter what. So it's always gonna keep rolling. And then if if Kasai keeps rolling or Dorinthia keeps rolling, you are then in a very bad position. Um, so yeah, it is a very good card. Um, I mean, and yeah, Blade, Blade Throw is good as well. You know, an, uh, you know, an equipment is good when it immediately replaces Tunic in like everyone's lists, right? I've seen a bunch yeah. of warrior lists and people posting on like social media, and it, they've tunic's gone. It's out. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Blocks for two as well. Ridiculous. So, um, yeah. So I've seen a lot, seen a lot of uh, a lot of cool new heavy hitters cards as a result of doing this, uh, doing this league that means nothing ultimately. But been able to see a lot of the uh, a lot of the new cards being played. Um, haven't seen too many KO games yet, but there are, I'm actually in. I'm in round. I'm going to be doing round three soon. I'm actually going to be playing against Carlos from the Fabratorium Spanish team, 
uh, and he's going to be playing KO and I'm playing Azalea. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes down. Um, but yeah, KO is looking obviously very, very good as well. Just generically good mm-hmm. across the board. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So should we get to some of our sort of plan, sort of planned topics? And by planned topics, I mean, we kind of like drummed them up like five minutes before we uh, hit the record button. Um, <laughs> much, yeah. And they were just kind of like... Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so uh, we have a couple. We have one that has to do with the frequency of Flesh and Blood releases. Um, and that, that that basically was um, brought upon by just talking about how it's kind of a slow news week. And then I was like, yeah, it's going to be a slow news, news week for quite a while, actually, just because um, we literally just had heavy hitters come out. And we have several months before Part the Misville is uh is going to be live right um we even have several months before the world premiere event in in tokyo um so i between now and then we have just like competitive level events so um we have the pro tour but unless you're like uh someone who really cares about the pro scene which i imagine a lot of the flesh and blood players do um Mm -hmm. there's not a ton (laughs) there's not gonna be a ton to talk about and that also leads into our second topic which is Hey, where's the lore, yo? Um, so yeah, well, let's talk about. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. If you had something to say, I was gonna say yeah. I mean, it, it all sort of rolls into one, you know, one pretty deep conversation, really. But um, yeah, first of all, the releases. If we compare this to other games, how does how does Flesh and Blood okay. sort of stack up? Let's okay. Wise? First of all, let's not compare it to Magic because Magic is actually insane. They just have releases yeah. like every like four minutes. Um, so we're not going to compare it to Magic, who literally at at uh, at the Magic Con Chicago, they're like, "Hey, uh, here's all the sets that we have coming out next year. We already talked about them, but here's some spoilers for like all of the sets, and uh, here's like the box art for all of them. It's just like stay hype all the time. Like you better be hyped. Here's a cute little furry like uh, mouse mom with a sword, and here's like a, a shirtless cowboy man. They're like be hype." Um, so it doesn't end. Doesn't you can't stops, you it? can't compare it to Magic. But let's, let's talk about other games other than Magic, right? Um, <laughs> I feel most games release that's not that, that aren't Flesh and Blood. They they release about um, four to five ish kind of sets sets a year. That that feels like pretty normal to me. Um, maybe one per season plus an extra here or there. Um, maybe a supplemental product or or, or some some sort of effect like that. Um, smaller games uh, like uh, Grand Archive. Uh, tend to release about the same as Flesh and Blood, but uh, it's hard to say with Grand Archive because uh, they are going to be celebrating their one year anniversary just just in a few months. So they don't really have uh, that much of a track record to, to fall back on. But I feel like Flesh and Blood is on the lower side of things is what I'm getting at, right? With with releasing only three sets a year. Um, and I think there are some definite positives and negatives from that. Um, there's some very like... Well, it's like a, it really is a double-edged sword. I was gonna say it's really consumer friendly, and in terms of uh, wallet fatigue, yeah, it's definitely. But also in terms of like audience retention, interest in the game, um, and maybe just players who just want to interact more with with the with the game and the world and the lore, it might be a little bit more difficult um, with with everything else you know coming out. So um, I think this is worth having like a little bit of a little bit of a d- discussion on um so yeah what oh, do you yeah. what do you guys personally think about about this uh like three set kind of release because like they did they did kind of double down on it recently they were like nope we're doing three sets this year they're going to be all draftable maybe some extra stuff but they really haven't talked about that extra stuff i mean i uh i think that the th- three product a year model does work uh like you were saying especially for product fatigue uh purposes because that is a real thing i know you just said you didn't want to talk about magic but that's that's the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to product fatigue um yeah but i i do think that for flesh and blood specifically at least recently um having the three product a year model means that your sets have to kind of be bangers for like you said retention purposes yeah um with a, a very heavy uh, gesture towards bright lights, um, I, as much of a as much of a product as I liked it to be, um, it did I think overall probably negatively affect the people that don't care about um, 
about Mechanologist. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna extend that to Dust Till Dawn as well because yep. Dust Till Dawn was a supplemental set, but it really mostly focused on Shadow and Light. And I feel if you don't care about Shadow and Light or Mech, you had a kind of a kind of a rough year last year for Flesh and Blood. Yeah. I mean, that feeds it feeds back into one of our other episodes as well uh, regarding the hero problem that we were speaking yeah. about. Because if because if you had if you had no heroes last year that you enjoy or gravitate towards, that's another thing as well that hurts with the fact that there's not many releases because mm-hmm. you're not going to get you're not really going to get stuff for your hero. I mean, the, the expansion slot can sometimes save that, but how often is the expansion slot going to have something for your hero in it? I mean, is it, yeah. is, it gar- is it guaranteed or not? Are we always going to see a ranger card in, in in a set? I don't know. And even then, like it's only a couple too. Like even if it is like a good card, yeah. it's like one, it's like one card. Um, yeah. And like the like I said, the reason we kind of like are talking about this is because we're like, wow, it's such a slow, it's such a exactly. slow news week. But it's gonna it's gonna be like this for a while um, until we start getting more information about um, part the misvel. And, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Bill. Like, I, I don't want it to be like magic. No, no, no. But, um, personally, I would like four sets a year. I think every three months is a good cadence. I think three months gives you more than enough time to like, you know, enjoy the, the latest set, draft it and play sealed. And then also, you know, save up a little bit for whatever you want to buy. Um, four months just feels like a little too slow to me to be honest um like once you start getting into that last month you're just like come on just give me give me anything like i I want something i want to i want to engage like some some way and and like bill said if the previous set wasn't like to your liking then it could feel even even worse and i think one of the reasons that i felt kind of like uh, burnt out's not the right word but like slightly more and more disinterested last year with flesh and blood because it started out with like my favorite set of all time and then Dust Till Dawn is like cool, but I was like, I don't really plan on playing with any of these cards, really. I mean, I, I made I made kind of like a, a Highlander Angel deck that I play with Az, and that was kind of cool, I guess. But I mean, that's not enough to keep me, you know, interested for four months. And then we had Bright Lights, which same kind of deal. It's a cool set. I think it's, has, you know, I, I dig the vibes, but um, I didn't rush out to build new decks for all three, all three heroes. I, I played basically um, some Crack Shuffle play and that that was that was kind of that was kind of it so there's like eight months plus you know a little bit more right so like if you if, even if you include the time you're waiting from outsiders to the next set that's like 12 months like almost uh waiting for the next set um to, to pique your interest it can be it can be kind of a lot um how about what yeah. do you think as about about that yeah exactly I, I feel i feel the same way because obviously outsiders was a huge set for me personally absolutely loved it not only from a spoiler perspective but also a um but also from a theme and aesthetic perspective and the fact that azalea became good as a result and that was my favorite hero but then after that it was like it was like the highs of outsiders so then you know spoiling spoiling cards couldn't come into it but then it was just like okay i've got a a common card now for you know this warrior this light warrior card that i'm never going to use or ever ever going to play and i appreciate spoiling cards and stuff but the set of bright of uh of dust till dawn was just like i'm never going to play shadow or light heroes to be honest mm-hmm. um so i didn't really buy any of it whatsoever um it was a cool it was a cool sort of event to a certain degree and seeing like demons and angels and all this but i still have no idea where the law is or what or what is going on oh. i don't know I don't, I don't think that's very clear to be i honest, will but. say for for at least dust till dawn's credit i liked the lore for dust till dawn so i actually read all the lore for dust till dawn um i i enjoyed that we'll get into the lore for heavy hitters and, and later we'll get we'll get to that later um yeah but that's why i thought i would just signpost it a bit yeah so yeah but but i actually really enjoyed the lore for for heavy hitter or no no for for uh dust till dawn um and the lore for Bright Lights was was pretty interesting too. Uh, it was kind of a weird one where they kind of sort of retconned a lot of metric stuff um, from what had been previously established. They made it a lot more like high tech, right? There was a, a large discussion about like where's all the steampunk? It's all like cyberpunk now. Um, and yeah. I think I think some of the response from the the 
folks at LSS was like they just thought they just thought that was cooler, um, which is fair enough. But um, um, yeah, I mean it's it, it, it's cooler. That's definitely that's definitely definitely a way to put it. But you know, is it is it coherent with what is actually going on, or is it just is it just a story set in the future? What is it? You know, for I mean, people that want, I mean, people Wraith, Wraith, Wraith literally has like mecha now. Like, there's actual. It's not just mm-hmm. like oh, haha, yeah. fantasy robot mecha. No, it's actually just a like like an actual mecha that you'd see in like Mech Warrior or like Gundam or something. They have like machine guns and like rockets and stuff, and it's like yeah, like it was a weird. It was kind of oh, like right. this weird disconnect. Um, and I yeah, I did listen to the reasons why. And if you're curious, if you never like, if you didn't dig dig super deep like I did and listen to all like the interviews. The reasons that James said is like that, like the reasons why you don't see these mechs like going up to to to, to smash up Solana or or the, the monastery or whatever is for two reasons. One, they don't care, uh, which is okay, sure, yeah. And then two, I heard that like they don't work t- if they're too far away from metrics. Like they need to be close to their power source, um, right. which also makes sense. But it's 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 still a weird kind of thing where you have Reinar and Ko who's just like. They're basically just like naked orc dudes. One of them has one arm and he's fighting with a claw made out of like spider mandibles. And then you have literally Evangelion like over <laughs> over in metrics, like yeah. where 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 Teclavasan has ascended to a higher being <laughs> through through shadow and like nano machines or whatever. Um, shadow, what what's going on there? What's the shadow implications? I just don't understand. He, uh, so, I don't know. He like tapped into like Arathiel or something through like machines or something like. It's not super clear, but yeah, he's Shadow now. He, he's he's become um, Ultron or something. I I don't know. Yeah. Like, but Mechlovasen. yeah, Me- Mechlovasen. <laughs> Mechlo Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> but I just think I, th- I think there could be a I think there could be a hard reset on the way law is delivered. Uh, Maybe this game because they have a law page now, so they could just do like a they could just do like a weekly thing or a monthly thing that says oh, okay this character is doing this now and you know this is the the ongoing story this is where this character is because we still don't know much about riptide and azuri and stuff from outsiders mm-hmm. it wasn't much for them either was there really they had they had a couple so the riptide didn't have a whole lot Uzuri had yeah. the most from outsiders as she was kind of like the central character so we had one story that was like her origin story of like uh, traveling from uh, Mysteria to um, to the pits, and it was kind of like her first gig with the spider that kind of like got her in. And then we had another story when she was already like uh, I think this is more current Uzuri, where she's like a, a like the big boss. Uh, she's like one of like the head um, uh, of the spider clan, and uh, there's kind of like a little bit of like intrigue because Arachne had assassinated the emperor. And um, the contract was was forged. It, it was like it was like uh, supposedly written by Uzuri, but she did not actually write it off. So it was like the contract was like forged. And there's like a, a little bit of political intrigue between uh, that and this other spider um, person. And um, that that's basically what we got. We got a little, little bit of intrigue about like, oh, someone is trying to, you know, someone got Arachne to assassinate the emperor, but it wasn't uh, an official contract. And we don't really know who signed off on the contract and you know that that kind of stuff but it's all just kind of like leading you on to more and more stuff there's nothing like ever really finishes it's just like okay now we just need to learn a little bit more and yeah like where's that where's that thread gone we're now a year later hopefully we still still this might this might be like copium like copious amounts of copium (laughs) but my hope is that part the mist veil you know, helps coincide, you know, helps like, you know, tie those things together because Uzuri has like a history with Mysteria. There's like various yeah. like uh, martial clans, you know, the spider, but there's also a bunch of other clans in, in Mysteria. And um, like they made a very strong point in Uzuri's story to like mention Mysteria. And they showed like this, um, this picture that had a bunch of like former like gang members. And one of them was Katsu. Um, it was like, hidden but he was definitely katsu he had the hat but he also had the the signature gem that katsu wears around his neck um 
and uh, it has been confirmed yes it is it is katsu that's not speculation um um so yeah there's a little bit of tie there and i really hope they they help bring the the overall narrative a little bit together um but we'll, but we'll see uh we, we we shall see and i think it just kind of is part of the overall like waiting four months for a new set and then like if you're a lore buff and the set drops and there's like nothing or it just has nothing to do with anything else which is if it has nothing to do with anything else that's still kind of cool it feels like they're building up their world as we explore all the all of the little bits but um it would also be cool to like you know see the threads tied together we, like i said we did see this a little bit with with dust hold on we did we you know we saw lexi and and oldham and bravo and stuff come in and like help solana which is why i said i, I did think they did a good job with the the dust hold on stuff but now we're here at uh, heavy at heavy hitters, um, so if yeah, we can, I mean, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I would, I was just say, I'd like to, um, I'd like to see. I don't like to bring up magic too much, but it all, it all sort of, it all sort of melds together with the Living Legends podcast. Oh, we like all, yeah. we like all things games and everything. So, um, what what magic used to do when I was like doing other things on my old old channel because i did like a law reading section on one of my old channels past the turn i'm not sure whether it's still called that i might have tried to change it but uh tangents aside uh, i used to read the law parts of the magic the gathering stories and if you look on wizards.com or whatever it's called um each set has like uh a load of story articles like you got like mm -hmm. Cal Time, Cal Time is the one that I remember because I did the law readings for this, and it's all on the internet still. So go and find it if you dare. Um, but there was episode one, Travelers, which he said the little blurb says the planeswalker Kaya hunts a terrifying monster on the Viking plane of Cal Time, which ended up being Vorinclex at the time. Then episode two, episode two is Awaken the Trolls. Kaya encounters the God of Lies, which is Tibalt at the time. Um, and then episode three is the saga of Tibalt. So that goes into explaining why Tibalt's doing what he's doing and all this. Episode four is into the demon's realm. So, and then the episode five is the big battle at the end, where all the sort of uh, all the sort of allies and stuff go against all the all the demons and stuff on Kalheim. Um, so, just like something like that could be really really cool. You know, episode one, episode two, episode three. And I believe, if I remember correctly, that those episodes didn't come out all at the same time. I think it, I think it was like episodic in nature. So if you went to the Wizards website week two, you then got episode two. So that's that's one that's one thing I think Flesh and Blood could really really sort of lean on is that sort of episodic nature, like the whole sort of soap opera style thing. Uh, because yeah, when I did that, when I did the law readings for Cal Time, I was checking back every week because I wanted to know whether the next one was done, so I could read it out to my non-existent audience at the time. Yeah. Um, so so <laughs> may, may, maybe something like that could be could be cool because I really enjoyed how they delivered it. I mean, not sure whether you've seen that at all. A, a lot of uh, a lot of po folks like like to trash on magic for various reasons. A lot of it is very justified. Um, but yeah. I have seen a lot of people complain about magic story. But to be honest, as someone who it has like keeps tabs on like almost every single card game under the sun, including all of the weird, obscure ones. Magic is one of the games that does it better than almost anyone else. Like outside of literal animated shows that like Yu-Gi-Oh has and stuff like outside of actual animated shows in terms of like just lore drops and articles and stuff. Magic at least has it <laughs> like people, people yeah. can critique uh, the stories themselves and whether or not they're relevant or whatever. Cause I know there was some like, you know the, the infamous war of the spark stuff but um you know yeah. at least they have it <laughs> like um whereas a lot of a lot of card games just just kind of don't um that's so what i mean though as well as a lot of people a lot of people love the characters and the and the heroes of flesh and blood so i think a lot of people will like to have stories and want to know yeah. where their characters are um, um, and what they're doing at different points in different sets of the game um like i'm just looking at magic again here because it's all it's all relevant it's all on topic murders at karlov manor which is the the mm. recent set it has the exact same thing as episode yeah. one kaya returns to ravnica for the first time then episode two with the help of a brilliant detective the killer is discovered so, etc so I, i've been i don't buy a lot of magic stuff and i, I don't 
I don't engage with a lot of magic stuff these days, but I actually have been following along with some of the lore. Um, I'm subscribed to a couple magic channels. Most of them are friend, friends of mine, like uh, like the, yeah. the, the, the Spike Feeders. Um, but I have been following along with some of the lore. And there was a, um, another channel that I really like uh, called Loading Ready Run did like a whole recap of all of the murders at Carlov Manor uh, story. I found it pretty interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, they did kind of like a little summary, uh, like podcast video, which which is pretty cool. Um, and the magic story right now is is pretty interesting. They're, they're is basically following one character. Um, it's the character with my name, which is insane to me. It's a character named Kellen, um, spelled with an A instead of an E, but it's, it's still my name. It's weird. Anytime anyone says the name, I'm like, no one has my name. So <laughs> hearing another person say it's weird to me, but. <laughs> it's basically following this character Kellen throughout the multiverse as he tries to find his father Oko, um, and he's like, you know, gets up wrapped up in all these shenanigans. And I think it's kind of a it's, it's kind of a fun like plot device as a way to explore all of these different. Um, you oh, know. Oko, is it Oko? Oko is it? Yeah, Oko. Is Oko is Kellen's father. Kellen is like half oh, fae. Okay. Yeah, so he's originally from the plane of Eldraine. So it started with the Eldraine set, and then it moved to like Ixalan and murders a color of manor, and it's going to you know follow him throughout. Um, you know, you cowboy cowboy time yeah, coming up. Um, but it, it's a cool brilliant. it's a cool device that's, that's where great. like you have one character and he experiences all this all of this stuff, which is it. I don't know. I think I think it's kind of cool. Even though I'm not like super engaged with magic right now, I think you know other other games could maybe potentially learn a little bit from it. And one thing I was thinking while I was as I was talking is, <clears throat> and this is something that I kind of want to do for a video but i don't know if i have enough to talk make, make into a full video is flesh and blood really reminds me of legend of the five rings in like more ways than one um and for for better or worse the the clans in legend of the five rings remind me of the classes in um flesh and blood right where a set would come out for L5R and it would only have like three clans. You'd have like Crane Clan, Mantis Clan, and Dragon Clan or whatever. And then if you played like Crab, you're like, I don't care about the set because Crab Crab's not in the set. And yeah, Flesh and Blood is kind of like that, um, but with the classes. Uh, I would I would like, and this is going to tie into the topic right now. I, I would really like Flesh and Blood to take more from L5R story, where they incorporated story heavily into into everything um where like you know a new set drops and then now you just have a ton more lore about the three classes and the heroes you know like i think a lot of folks would like that um but uh, at the end of the day i i also think a lot of their focus is just on being a competitive card game um and a lot of the resources yeah, is poured into that yeah, but they do have to break out of that. That's the thing. They need to do that, really. I mean, I would uh, like, somehow. I would like to see it. I, I, I would personally like to see it. Um. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, I guess that can lead us to um, heavy hitters, where like, heavy hitters has like no lore, like, like at all. Like, I, I there's yeah. like, there's like the hero pages, and there's a little bit about the heroes on the hero pages, but like. Not much outside of that. In fact, let me let me pull up on my phone. I'll pull up the the hero pages. Yeah, so we're gonna look at this live right now. But yeah, what sort of sparked it off was the fact that uh, Kale, aka Dead Summer Art, the DM of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons session we did, which was awesome. The maybe the a best, part, maybe a part two coming soon. Yeah, the the best Dungeons and Dragons session set in the world of Flesh and Blood. It's also the only one, but it's also the, the best one. one. Right. Yeah, by default, the best. <laughs> yeah. Default. Seriously, go watch it. It didn't get a whole lot of views, but it's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Good one. Um, but yeah, it was uh, sort of sort of came to mind because of what Kale said on uh, on Twitter recently. Is that um, there is no there is no law for heavy hitters whatsoever, and uh, I retweeted it saying, "Well, if you would have hired Kale from Dead Summer Art LSS, you, this this issue would be fixed because that guy is just on it." He's a very creative mind and is very, very keen to write stories. Um, so I, I believe they've hired someone for that role, but um, it would, it would, it would, it would, yeah, it's, it's nothing come of it as of yet. So I do hope it's in the cauldron being brewed, but we'll see. Yeah. So I have an idea about what might be going on with heavy hitters, 
Once again, it also might be copium, so we'll see. Um, but I do want to mention, so I pulled up uh, Kasai, which is like kind of like the headliner hero of the set. She's the first set that, or she's the first hero that they showed, and she, in terms of like lore relevance, she's the most important because she's the only hero in here that actually had a, a story beforehand. Even Ko didn't really have much of a story. Like he he fought like a dragon or something like that was his story um yeah where kasai actually has a story she's like trying to get revenge for her family and trying to build an army and all this kind of stuff and on her hero page she literally has four paragraphs uh one of those four paragraphs is two sentences um that yeah. that's it uh if you want to count the mechanics paragraphs six paragraphs uh, and then you click the the story and the story literally just has a 51 second video um that's it that, that's all there is um which is like you know people who really want you know to engage with the lore and the story um like i said you know magic has like 10 stories per you know set for the last few sets regardless of the quality of those stories we're not talking about that we're just talking about the, the fact that they exist um and uh yeah so i mean I wanna, and that's kasai I just want to throw this out there before it leaves my mind because I think it's an mm -hmm, interesting mm -hmm. point. But do you think um, do you think their story and their direction of telling stories is limited by the fact that their mechanics inherently allow characters to fade off into the sunset in Living Legend, so they just don't have they don't have any implications in the story mm. anymore because they're no longer fighting or, or no? I no uh, I think that's an opportunity to write a banger story that that's not a downside that is an upside they should use that to write the characters into the story and if the if the characters fade off into legend it should become part of the story like like i said like i think they should they should you know take more from legend of the five rings where like the tournament winning clans like they win in the story like that that's one of the coolest parts of legend of the five rings is like the players would affect the world and they could definitely do that. And I, I pulled up another hero. So I, I mentioned I mentioned Kasai, and she's got like four paragraphs, and then like maybe two extra. And I was like, you know what? What about the what about the new characters? Betsy, two paragraphs. That's it. Literally just has two paragraphs. Um, Olympia. Let me let me pull up Olympia. I bet it's gonna be similar. He's got three three paragraphs. One more. But I mean, like if you are like getting into flesh and blood, like, oh, I want to know about these characters. There, there's not a lot. My. I bet his three character, his three paragraphs are, I am a gladiator. That's it. I, mean, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I am Spartacus. He's, yeah. well, he spent his <laughs> early I'm, years I'm, as a beggar, and then he captivated audiences with his showmanship. Uh, and now he's a, he's a prize fighter. Um, so just, yeah, just stock characterizations of a gladiator character, and that's it. There's nothing uh, else. So here, my copium, <laughs> my copium is because they're doing the heavy hitters like leaderboard thing with all of the heroes winning the events and stuff maybe they're waiting until that is done and then they're going to write a story with that as the outcome right like maybe they're going to be like oh if, if kasai wins the heavy hitters leaderboard maybe that means she wins the arena in the lore um and then they'll they'll go from that that's my copium take uh, as to why it's not out yet um I'm trying to throw him a bone here. I'm trying to I'm trying to give LSS a little bit of a pass. Um but it could also just be nothing, right? It could also just be four months and here's uh, Parthamus Phil. Um I mean what would what would you what would you prefer to have? Would you prefer to have a storyline that James has crafted for Act One, Two, and Three, which apparently is what War of the Monarch's gonna be? Or would you prefer to have a proactive story that the actual players themselves can influence the story? I think because you could they, do they, they both. Be, you think you could do both. That's I think fine. you can do both, right? I think you can have like the idea, like the plot laid out. And then for something like heavy hitters, they could have been like, here's the story, like about how all of the, uh, all of the heroes got into the arena, why they're there, how KO got captured, why the hell Reinar is there, set it all up. And then like publish all these stories right when the set comes out and then be like, this the the winner of this will determine you know who's the victor of of the arena and then they could like bake that into like the thing the right game. yeah so they yeah. could they could have done both they could have like here's the leading up to it and then like the players do it and maybe they have some rough ideas of like where they want to go depending on who wins um but i think it's just they don't have the resources for it and that's mostly because they're pouring all the resources into competitive play um mm. which isn't a bad thing i mean that's why people play the game but um 
you know, lore, lore is important to help, you know, keep other people like engaged with your, with your product. Um, so, so like I said, trying to throw them a little bit of a bone, but, but, um, more lore would be cool. Like I, it really felt like some of the lords that got, got petered off like quite a bit. Um, I remember they were like back in Arcane Rising, they'd be like Viscerai's tale will continue. And it, we don't, it, oh, yeah. he, we, we've seen him in like three cards and like, we're like, I guess he's in Irathiel now. Yeah. We'll yeah I guess it. he's like, he's got like some homies too. Like the art, he's just got like some, you know, like hooded figures. So mm-hmm. he's doing something. Um, yeah. I mean, for all the, for all the great things that, design have come up with for the actual game and the mechanics themselves this year obviously we've seen them come very very far with, with terms of that there are still things that need to be ironed out and that's obviously you know the whole law thing is definitely one of them um because yeah i'd love to love to hear what people think in the comments below because it is something that we feel is a little bit lacking um and for a hero centric character driven you're gravitating towards one character perhaps only like I can speak for myself here, um, apart from maybe Olympia recently, because you know three hundred mm. and Sparta sort of vibes, um, and that six pack. My God, that six pack. Anyway, um, yeah, it's one of those things that um, I think needs a lot more fleshing out. No pun intended, because yeah, it's character driven, and we want to know where our favourite characters end up and what adventures they yeah. go on. But what, but what you were saying about that that Kellen character. That is a great way to do it. You know, you could just have okay. This is what Dory's doing. She's now in. I guess you can't. You can't really do that though. Can I, you? Because I they thought they were going to do that with Lexi because like Lexi was like assembling a crew in Arya. So she like had Lexi and there was like Yorick and Oldham and and Briar. Yeah. And it sounded like they were going to go out and like adventure and try to bring more people to help Arya. And we saw that like in Dust Till Dawn, but that was that. That was like that was the only thing that came of that ever since Tales of Arya. Because um, yeah, Le- Lexi, Briar, and Oldham just got the hell out of there ASAP because they're yeah. too powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, we're here now. Um, like, let's go on adventure. Oh wait, we were too OP. Came completed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really do feel like it is like um, like a staffing kind of thing because like I don't want to. This isn't throwing shade to the current creative team. I'm sure they're like insanely busy making the next set. I mean, I'm sure that that's exactly what they're doing. They're like all of their resources are poured into like designing the art and the world and the flavor for Mysteria. Uh, they just don't have time or resources to write the current stuff for, for heavy hitters. Um, and they don't have yeah. time to write the current, they probably might not have time to write the stuff for, uh, to par- part the Miss Vale, uh, which is hopefully why they hired an, you know, an extra writer. Um, but that, that's what I imagine the case is you know going on here like why they don't have it is because they're all of the creative team's attention is just on the next set right um unlike magic I, they're not working like three years in advance or whatever it is that magic does like we heard from brian gottlieb they're literally working on like the next couple sets like now um so they like yeah. gotta like get it done and i'm sure like part the miss is like already done but i'm talking about like the set after you know like set you know the third set this year, the first set the next year. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're still not like super far in advance. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it feels yeah. like maybe maybe they're going to be on the right track uh, soon. You know, if it feels like design is starting to kind of settle into things and hopefully that'll help, you know, creative settle into things a little bit more. It, it feels like there's a lot of growing pains. Um and not the typical like oh they overprinted or underprinted kind of growing pains. I'm talking like from a an overall game making standpoint. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, there was a lot of a change, lot of a lot of changes at LSS, wasn't there? Obviously, they moved into new offices, done all that, and obviously they got a lot more staff now. So I guess it's just one of those things that um, is interesting to see happen because obviously we've been we've been around for a while um you know you you since the beginning cal but i've been here now for three years and i reckon you you pretty much been around for three years too bill and we've seen a lot change um it, in that time so it's it's such a weird thing like maybe it's just because they had so much time to to cook it but like they came out of the gates pretty strong with like the lore book and everything and it was just like i remember even back in the day people were like hey where's the lore book for arcane rising and then just no lore book ever ever since then because even in the lore book it says on the back page it's like 
like oh and next up we have arcane rising and it had a couple like spoilers for some of the oh, art really actually yeah yeah really yeah it had some spoilers for art because it had like um uh take aim it had like a the image of take aim and some other like random stuff and people were like oh this is cool but like after that there's nothing um it, they tried a little bit with like the classic battles thing but that didn't really yeah. pan out all that well um so no, yeah 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 Thanks. we'll see i mean it sounds like they're making a lot of money they they made like the super exclusive like prism statues that are like gonna be worth thousands of dollars like can, can you lore book please second lore book reprint of the first lore book i know a lot of people would love to buy that um like it'd be cool but yeah it's just these these things like a lore book you know is there a reason why they're not it's they, the same, they, with, like, they, the it's same with like the merchandise as well right people would buy that if there was a website that they could sell it on so why are they not doing that i guess yeah to to the credit about the lore book they did say this at one point is that they don't they didn't have a good way to manufacture it at the right. quantities that they would like they were looking for a manufacturer but that was like bro that was like four years ago like yeah. two like four three or four years ago so i don't i don't know maybe once again it might just be one of those things where they're like it's not a concern of ours right now and they just pushed it to the side um True. and just just got forgotten about with the insane growth that they've had i guess perhaps yeah right. um so like yeah. you know, like i said it sounds like they're doing really well i watched that video of like um like they that the new zealand reporter was like oh you guys are doing so well you're gonna be like unicorn status yada 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 and james was like yeah, yeah we're doing we're doing good um so i mean hopefully that can translate into, into more lore um maybe even like as said like merch and i can't help but compare it to like other other games too even much much smaller games so like i've been really supporting grand archive a lot ever since its release and grand archive also a very small game even smaller than much much smaller than flesh and blood and they are also a little struggling to put out lore but they do have like complete stories um there's only three sets but i think there's like you know multiple stories about and these are like character specific stories too um and then uh they do have merch drops um what they do it's not a it's not a permanent merch store what they'll do is they'll uh, make the merch and then it'll be like hey it's merch day and then like they put the merch up and then it, it sells out immediately like you can get like stuff like like these really cool deck boxes that have like like the character design inside and stuff and um shirts and beanies and whatever like just they have merch um and it would yeah, be I've cool seen a few i've seen a few sort of i can't remember who who done it but someone did like a viscerai box yeah. well not a viscerai box it's like a rune blade original character box maybe deck box um that sort of stuff would sell instantly if there was a deck box yeah. like that that you that you just said with premeditate art on the back of it you know and maybe some proceeds went to izawadi because he did the art or whatever that stuff would sell so quickly, but yeah, it's just manufacturing, I guess. But well, like, yeah, like about... oh. Grand Archive has a little bit of an up just because the the manufacturer for their cards they don't card they don't go through Card of Monday like um like Flesh and Blood does. Their card manufacturer actually started as a high end um like goods manufacturer. They didn't actually make cards; they made like high end like other goods, and so making stuff like this for them is like much easier um so but yeah just maybe maybe flesh and blood just hasn't or lss hasn't established relationships with other manufacturers or something yeah maybe. but just a couple just a couple of uh, other sort of lasting things i want to mention on law and stuff um mm -hmm. so uh actually no one of the things i've noted down while speaking here is to do with the merch and that's something we mentioned to brian on the episode that he was on but the mission statement of flesh and blood is ingrained in a lot of people and that's the reason why people want to buy the merchandise because the mission statement is there bringing people through i can't remember what the mission statement is now through the common language of playing great games and all this i can't remember what it is uh but mm. that 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 statement is ingrained in a lot of us and that's why we want to buy the merch and support the actual studio without anything on is because we believe in them as a studio um so that's very very important and that's why a lot of people buy the merch in the first place um and another thing i wanted to point out as well is the um 
with regards to the law and the world building. Why is that important? Because if flesh and blood want to dominate the world, you know, the power of having an independent property, you have to, you have to expand on that. What, what, what does an independent property mean? It means movies. It means having Netflix shows. It means all these characters that people have come to know and love could be explored in other mediums as well. And that would grow your empire massively if your IP is already there and you're choosing not to do stuff with it. That's a missed opportunity, in my opinion, um, because the the IP is definitely there, but they're not really expanding on it. And it could just be growing pains, and they might not have the the resources to be able to put stuff into TV shows and movies and stuff just yet. But I guarantee there would be an audience for it. So, I mean, IP expanding the IP has definitely got to be on what on their list to do very soon. Yeah, I mean, they don't even have to do. Like TV shows and movies. I mean, they can do like just o- other just other merch lore. too, like lore, like books, like just exactly. I don't know, like comics. Yeah, things like the magic, things like the magic website do. Just give us those bits first, and if you know, people are going to love that, and that will make your IP stronger. Because at the moment, it's yeah, everyone loves the game and people love the characters, but you're not doing enough with those characters, but, and it, it could be a lot more than just characters on a card game it could be a lot more than that to be honest so yep and like i said like when i look at other card games like grand archive i think they recognize this they recognize that people like love their characters and um when i go to like the ascents and stuff like you see it like people are like i want the sylvie beanie like and they they go and buy like the beanie or like there was one person that was legitimately upset that they couldn't get the merlin playmat because it sold out so fast and like sucks for them they they didn't get the playmat but it's like a really good sign that someone like cared that much about the character, like that they wanted that specific, that 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 specific yeah. playmat from the merch store. Um, Absolutely. And I feel like Flesh and Blood could could you know go into a similar direction, you know. Um, yeah, yes. well, we have playmats. I mean, obviously Flesh and Blood has like playmats and stuff. But you see how like crazy people get like buying like the big cards at, at callings and uh, the uncut sheets and all all of that kind of stuff. Things that would be like. I mean, uncut sheets can be valuable, but like the big cards and um, the play mats and stuff, things that are not traditionally super valuable, just, you know, things that people want because they like the art or the characters or, yeah. you know, whatever. Something that resonates with them. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, more the, the end. The end thing is like we want more lore. That that's the, that's the takeaway. Give, give us more lore and give us more like ways to engage with flesh and blood. I think that's like that, that. I think that actually is the biggest topic of today. Give us more ways to engage with flesh and blood. I personally would like another set a year, but also like other things too, lore, merch, like, um, and with the with the news that they're doing well financially, they just moved into a nice fancy studio. It feels like they have the means to do so. Uh, so that would be cool if if they did. Yeah. Yeah. I just I I just don't, I I hope it's they don't. Well, obviously they are gonna they are gonna grow and they are gonna continue to expand on other things rather than just the competitive scene. But I don't want it all to be around. You know, what's the next pro tour? What's the next meta? All the time. It needs to be. I think there needs to be something else going it, on. It uh, does feel like it's kind of like that right now. Yeah. So, like, uh, if, like, like right now. So seriously, let, let's like just get down to it right now. Right now in Flesh and Blood, if you are a Flesh and Blood player right now, if you don't care about the Pro Tour, what are you? How are you engaging with the game? Like, see, like, this is an actual question to our audience. If you don't care about the Pro Tour, like, if you do, that's cool. Like, you have the Pro Tour to look to, forward to. Um, but if you don't care about the Pro Tour, what are you? What are you doing in Flesh and Blood? Are you just kind of like? grinding out your local events are you are you playing like upf like what how are you engaging with with flesh and blood right like literally right now um i'm very curious to know because like for me i'm I'm finding it a little difficult right because like i'm not going to the pro tour um and uh like i play uzuri and it was cool seeing some uzuri stuff like i was pretty stoked to see some like top top uzuri stuff and i checked out the list and i was like hey they're playing some jank cards like me i'm like oh that's cool like uh they have a Spreading Plague and um, like this other these, these other cards that I like, but outside of that, I'm just like I don't have any interest to build like uh, Ko or anything. So I'm just like I'm just, I guess I'll just play Uzuri whenever we want to play CC or I guess like that, that's how I'm engaging with Flesh and Blood right now. And with 
I'm just waiting for you know part of the Mistvale news, I guess. Um, and maybe if they drop some lore, yeah. So I'm yeah. Gen genuinely curious. It's, it's, it's a it's a content thing as well, right? You know, for people that make content, for people that aren't making content on hyper competitive meta deck, pro tour winning decks, top eight, blah blah blah. That sort of stuff it's hard to find in these moments try like inspiration and sort of um motivation to do a video on something that probably nobody cares about because all people care about is the pro tour you know and that's what that's what i was struggling with at the beginning of the year is what content am i going to do this year because nobody cares about my opinion on azalea when there's better players than me you know i'm just appreciating the character and all this and luckily it's also it's also it's also a pro because it allows you to come up with weird and wacky ideas like the league that means absolutely nothing. I'm playing, you know, I'm hosting a CC event where there's no stakes, so there is still people out there that do want to just want to play this game for fun. Um, but um, but yeah, it's yeah when it's a slow when it's a slow news week or whatever, there's not much going on. It is hard to it is hard to consistently stay engaged. So yeah, the main question, as you said, was. Give us more. Well, give us more. More statement, I guess. Give us more ways to engage with the game, whether that's through law or whatever, because there is a lot of that missing at the moment still. Yep, yep, yep. I know. I know. Like a lot of the, if you go follow Flesh and Blood, like uh, on social media, you'll see all their posts about like it's like Road to Nationals right now. Like it's like art, yeah. all, like all RTN oh, yeah. stuff. Yep. Yeah. So it's all just competitive. Like these are the decks that are winning. Competitive RTN stuff. Well, like I said, I mean, like I, I think a lot of the Flesh and Blood players currently that that's kind of what they're into. And if you look at content out there, the content that gets views, it's all like these are the the meta heroes. These are the meta decks you should be paying attention to. This is what will win you your your RTN. Oh, Kano's busted. Oh, Kano's not busted. You know, like that's that's basically, basically what's going on right now, man. How to how to crush your heavy hitters pre-release. <laughs> yeah. And it's Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's like and if you want to do that kind of content, if you want to do it and not use Talishar, good luck. That's going to cost you like a, a fortune to build all these decks. Um Yeah. That's true actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I used to be able to do that. I can't do it anymore. It's it's so much and like it's just what it's just kind of how it is. I I, I suppose um Flesh and Blood was a game where I was able to build every deck, and now it's just like, hey, I have my one deck, my Uzuri deck. I love my Uzuri deck, and that's that's gonna be my my main way of like playing Flesh and Blood. Hey, I still have my Lexi Blitz. Uh, can't play her in CC anymore, but I can at least play her in Blitz. Um, so Turn around in Blitz, she? wow. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, like that. Yeah, I mean, at least I have, at least I can still play her to some degree. Um, Azalea's gonna get like that soon. I, not not soon, but eventually, I think she'll 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 LL and CC because she's she's pretty good. Um, she's pretty good, yeah. And then you're just gonna have her. You're just gonna have her in Blitz. Um, she's actually not bad in Blitz. She can like, if you can set up those dominate turns, man, you can just dunk them. Um, especially if you can like get multiple Red in the Ledgers in a turn with the health total so low, you can just win out of nowhere. Um. Yeah, I might have to might have to dabble in some dabble in some Azalea Blitz again uh, soon, but um, all, all all I fear is the is the uh, the the fridges that are now available because you know a, a large fridge like blocking for eight on board on a turn where you need to hit them as Azalea in Blitz is just not enough room to do anything most of the time. Uh, so if the, if they can block with a full suite of armor, um, that turn is pretty much. All you oh. need to just lose after that, so it's, it is yeah. tough. It's you tough you sleeve up, yeah. I was gonna say you sleeve up your Azalea deck when Ninja's the meta. Then you just hope to play against uh, Fi, and then you just dunk them. Yeah, go first, exactly. yeah, play against Fi and go first. There, there you go. <laughs> get him, get him with a dominated Red and Ledger turn one. Um, yeah. Hey, hey. So, but, yeah. yeah. So that like was, that was a bunch of ranting. For yeah, yeah. Day. It shouldn't be. I don't think this episode should be taken as like a, a doomer kind of thing, because at the end of the day, we just want more flesh and blood. Like that's the that's the that's the that's what we want. Yeah, yeah. Give us give us more flesh and blood. Um, and like I said, I personally would be would be very happy with four sets a year. As a content creator, I was always kind of worried about that. Honestly, like three sets a year, I was like, if you're only making flesh and blood content, how are you gonna stay like interesting? Like four months between sets, like. Man, that's a that's a long time. And if you're making like if you're like 
full-time content and you're making like you know three to five videos a week and for four months like man like you're gonna be scraping the bottom of the barrel like like pretty yeah. pretty fast um or you're just literally just when it becomes a bunch of just gameplay videos <laughs> like yeah it's just, just... Ga gameplay met videos and like meta reports like that and then like maybe like you you start posting like like finance stuff like i don't know like yeah yeah but that's not the it's, kind of it's, oh, yeah I mean, it's, 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 it's kind it's kind of i mean i said it's sometimes it's unmotivating and uninspiring but on the flip side of that for, for me personally it made me think of what i could do for content wise this year um and um yeah luckily I've, i found something that i wanted to do which has turned out pretty good um mm -hmm. and uh getting some friends on to do some casting and commentating over it as well uh is is always fun so it gives you guys a little bit extra to engage with the game as well perhaps mm -hmm. um but yeah it was it's uh it's, it's it's all it's all good fun um but yeah just give us more give us more flesh and blood please um that would be great thank you <laughs> cheers just listening yeah i I've, I've tried to think of ideas man I've, I've i've ran i've run through the gambit like for me personally it's it's a little tough because i i still do two videos uh, a month for channel fireball and that's kind of where my competitive minded stuff goes i've been putting a little bit more like new player friendly stuff there so i just did like a top five generic cards or top maybe it's a top 10 generic cards that every flesh and blood player should get and i, will, I really wanted to make it like a legit list not just kind of like here's the budget options i'm like these are the the cards that you will actually need to get if you want to play flesh of blood so command and conquer uh art of war e-strike but also stuff like um sink below uh ravenous rabble there's a good there's a good mix of mix of like budget cards and well they're not budget cards just cards that incidentally cost cheaper because they're commons but you still need them if you're playing flesh and blood but that kind of content yeah. i put on that that channel because well the it's like sponsored right like um yeah it's not so, reaching as well so it'll help more people i guess won't it channel fireball have quite a large subscriber base don't they I they think. have a they have a lot of subscribers but it wouldn't it doesn't get as many views as it would if if i posted it on my channel but i think that's just because i have a lot of flesh and blood players already um yeah on my, my channel yeah. um but like that's cool though. Yeah, so I've been trying to think about some more ways. I, I I have a lot of ideas for the other card games that I that I'm covering, but um, for Flesh and Blood, it's a little it's a little tough because, like for example, like I said, for it's it's really hard to build all the decks, and I really don't want to use Talishar. I, I actually would rather actually you know have the physical decks. And for Shadowverse, it's really easy. I just buy the case. I have a full playset of everything. I literally build every single deck I want. Meme deck, meta deck. I can build whatever I want. It's easy. Uh, for Flesh and Blood, I I would have to spend like triple or quadruple that amount. Um, which is just, dude. If you think content creators are making that much money, you're you're fool, you're fooling yourself. Um, yeah. And um, I'm trying to think of like more interesting things that I haven't done yet. I do want to host for this. Is, once again, this is just waiting for part the misfell. I do want to do like a starter deck tournament kind of, you know, thing on on my Discord. I think that could be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. But. You know, we have to we have to get there. We have to we have to wait. Um, so until then, hey, if you have any ideas, let us know in the comments down below, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. Any what, ideas? What, what content? What content would you like to see that maybe that maybe none of us do or you haven't seen? Let us know what what sort of flesh and blood content is missing from the sphere, perhaps. Um, but. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, that's all I reckon that's pretty much all we've all we've got in the tank today. Yeah, because like, because I've been paying attention to a lot of the flesh and blood content out there, and the content that does well, like uh, Stephen Diarmada, good friend of uh, good friend of the podcast and good friend of ours, he's doing pretty well. But his videos are all like meta reports, like it's just like top meta decks. That that's based, like meta decks and news is what he's doing, and it's doing well. But um, like, is there anything yeah. else <laughs> like? um yeah yeah but there's, there's there's a there's a lot of content out there which is like more like video essay type things and those are fairly interesting um mm. because they're not really based on any news or any sort of those stuff. It's more like the unfortunate before. truth behind those videos are that unless you are getting ristic studies as in more magic references ristic studies or spice eight rack views they are not worth mm. it you're gonna spend yeah. hundreds and hundreds of hours and you're going to get like 
even if you do well for flesh and blood like ten thousand views would be like 20 bucks like you would get no no return on that at all um and maybe not even a lot of subscribers or like constantly you know they'll be like oh that's a cool video and they just watch the next thing right um yeah th those yeah. those type of videos are very like double-edged swords um but and do you want to give a shout out to once again not not a big you know the people who do them for flesh and blood it, it's uh it's very cool to see that uh, i think like was it like gorgonian tome uh, has done done some um Troy. yeah but uh yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of work we've done quite a few as well um yeah, he he's done a couple that uh, are, I would say like a little bit a little bit smaller than uh, some of the the big the big ones that are like the history of chain, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's cool stuff. But um, yeah, as you say, it's a lot of work for I guess what what that person or what they're getting back from a YouTube perspective. Depends what you want to get from it, I guess. You know, if you want, if you just want, oh, that's a sick video, mate. Well done. You know, brilliant. Well done. That's good. That's good. Then, uh, then that's that's fine if that's what you want to get out of it. But yeah, monetary value at this stage, I think, for most flesh and blood, well, nobody's full time flesh and blood, are they? Like full on flesh and blood, full time. Yeah, like, like I, I'm full time, but I do three games mainline, and and honestly, I, I talk about whatever the hell I want. So I'm like, one of the videos I'm making right now is going to be like a anime card game merch haul that i that i just got that i'm like oh, this could be a fun video and i'm gonna give away some sleeves too because i bought too many um and i'm sure that video will yeah. probably do pretty well um like who wants some free anime sleeves um they're shadowverse but um for flesh and blood only like even steven doesn't do flesh and blood only uh he is mostly flesh and blood but he just put out like a video on, about altered um mm -hmm. i guess sloop dupe yeah. is like the he only does flesh and blood but even then like like even though his videos do pretty well, there's no way he can do full time with that. Like, yeah, yeah. Like just views alone, you would you would need like to do extra stuff. Like you'd have to have a good Patreon and a merch store and all the stuff. And there's a there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. So like, yeah. and, and pa Patreon's like a big backbone of a lot of creators stuff stuff as well. So we all have them as well, by the way. So dear viewers, if you're listening to this and you want to help support us, we do have them. So they're all on our respective websites. You know, Spike Feeders, Red Zone Road, Go Again Gaming. They'll all be in description boxes of videos on our channels. So if you want to do that, if you want to help, that's great. But that is the backbone of many creators' financial circumstances because that's like a a monthly thing that we can rely on to carry on. If you want to help someone become full time, that's probably the best way to do it because YouTube is not great. Even if you get thousands, oh yeah, views, dude. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you can attest you, for this, Cal. You you, you need it. like you need like hundreds of thousands like a day, like to yeah. to be able to like pay the rent. There's no no shot. So hmm. yeah, I, I remember a while ago one of my favorite YouTubers is a Northern Lion, and he kind of like this is a long time ago. He actually talked about like like how many videos he put out like a day and how many like views they would get. And he would put out like three, this is a while ago. He put out like three videos a day and each video would get like 60,000 views. And he was able to afford like, um, a small apartment in, in, um, Vancouver. Um, now he's doing quite well and the, you know, they bought a house and all that kind of stuff, but still like, that's, that's just kind of like the, the truth of it. So unless you're like getting hundred, hundred, hundreds of thousands of views, it's not good. It's not great. Um, a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot of people we respect, and probably a lot of people that you, dear viewer or listener, are are aware of. You know, I remember seeing a pleasant Kenobi video. Yeah, where he, he, talked, he like he talked he talk, went into depth about what he was earning and stuff. Very transparent video about what people can expect from YouTube, and it might be a little bit outdated now. It could be even worse as to what people get now. To be honest, uh, I imagine it's probably gone down from when he did it last, but. It is interesting seeing people speak about what you know what their their time into the videos that they create is actually worth. It's 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 horrendous, really. Um, if you're putting loads of time in, you're not getting much back. But the patrons and people that do contribute on that level are the most important ones for sure. Yeah, like so. Basically, the the long way, the the short way I think about it is that uh, YouTube is a good way to like get yourself known and to get like your brand out there. And if you can yeah. establish yourself as someone credible, um, at least this was my, my path, uh, you can, um, use it as a jumping point to do other stuff. So I do like casting. I've done, you know, stuff for this year, I've already done 
uh, Shadowverse Evolved Worlds. I did. I literally just came back from Grand Archive North American uh, Nationals. Um, and so, like, it's all just part of my thing now. So I do YouTube, but I do casting and I, I do stuff for uh, Channel Fireball and I have my merch store and all of it just kind of works together. And um, maybe someday... I can only do YouTube, but no, no, no time, no time soon. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really hard for physical card games too. like if, for, if you're doing like video games, like that's a little bit easier, right? Cause you could just turn on the game and you play and then maybe you have an editor or something and slap it on to YouTube, but physical card games, you literally have to get like the, the, the cameras out and the setup, the lighting. And if you can do gameplay, that's even trickier and yeah. I'm not saying it's bad. It's it's fun. I love what I do, but it's like harder than it looks. Um, oh, yeah. But but um, actually, that, that begs a question actually because um, I'm not sure if I've ever heard you say how you got into content creation on Spike Feeders Fab Bill. How did that How did that mm. come about? Because I'm not sure how how did that even start. Because I, when I when I remember seeing, I think it was because Jim appeared on a few videos to begin with, didn't he? I remember. Yeah. Correctly. The, my first time I saw them, I I don't remember if you, you DM'd me or something, but I did see you opening Tales of Aria. You were like, it was a Tales of Aria stream or something like that. I think that was the first time I saw, I think that's the first time I saw Spike oh. Feeders. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, fab. um, but Spike Feeders fab. I, uh, we, we had gotten into it because, uh, we had heard from, uh, Longtime friend of the channel, Olivia, uh, Olivia Gobert Hicks. She goes by Affinity for Artifacts on uh, social media. Mm. Uh, she's a absolutely spectacular uh, cosplayer. We found out uh, through her at it would have been a Monarch event because it was before Tales of Aria came out um, that uh, LSS had reached out to her and wanted her to uh, cosplay Prism for uh, that event. And so they gave her all this stuff. They paid her really well. Um, she came up with this absolutely gorgeous cosplay. Mm. Um, and then just through hearing like how much they uh, sort of compensated her and how much they cared about like content creators, um, we were like, well, maybe we should check this game out. This sounds kind of cool. And uh, so I started playing it and we already had the infrastructure for uh, gameplay videos because we were already doing Magic the Gathering stuff. Yeah. So um, we had just decided at that point, like, hey, why don't we uh, get into this game and and spin off and create a, a sister channel for for uh, flesh and blood stuff? And then um, it became even more uh, attractive for Jim as well because even though he doesn't really play, um, doesn't really play flesh and blood uh, past those first couple videos that you had mentioned as. Mm. Um, he uh, is able to, I think he's gotten the the workflow down to edit a gameplay video in like, it's like two hours, maybe like an hour. Um, like yeah. it's pretty fast. Um, I, 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 I don't want to speak for him or put words in his mouth because uh, I actually don't know what his editing process is, but I do know that it is significantly faster than, than, uh, than a commander game. Uh, and just the simplicity yeah. of the system, right? Because you know, you're just flashing yeah. up cards. I can I can speak for the league that means nothing recently. Been doing a lot of uh, edited gameplay videos, and luckily the luckily the players, because it's a webcam tournament, they put the dice down to signify how much damage it's doing. Because obviously you need that sort of aspect on webcam, and even streamers do it nowadays as well. But it is literally just flashing up a card each side. You know, for for each person that's playing a card. Um, so I imagine, mm -hmm. and I think Jim also on your videos does the like the values of the attack on each side as well. Yeah, uh, the flash yeah. up. So I it's, guess that's uh... not too much extra work. But yeah, that's yeah, that's also very helpful. So I was thinking of trying to emulate a little bit of that as well because that's pretty cool what he does there. Um, yeah, but Jim does all that. He said. Yeah, realistically, the uh, the most difficult thing is when we don't tell him. Uh, we don't tell him what the pitch values of cards are. Oh, Every yes. so often he'll have to contact yeah. us and be like, hey, what is this card that you played? Because he won't recognize it on his own. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a whole thing where that's that's why we uh, <laughs> one of the main reasons why when we're playing, we'll try our best to say like, oh, I'm pitching a yellow uh, pummel or whatever for uh, to pay for this. 
so that we can have the pitched cards show up on screen and then say i'm attacking with a red blah uh for x amount so that he can pull up the correct card and have it there with the correct attack value and then if it gets modified by something then um you can just swap out the number there so that's um, pretty good yeah it's a bunch of stuff that uh all sort of plays together it is a lot of work still like i don't want to downplay the amount of work that uh that jim puts into any of it because it's it's a lot more than yeah. i'm able to do even it's um, gameplay is a lot of like uh, tedious tedious work too it's like here get the get the card image put the little thing put the little transition it's just a whole bunch of that like a bunch of times and do you have to at least watch the entire match again just slower um you know you know get the timing right yeah yeah, that's kind of that's kind of why I've liked this. What I'm doing at the moment because I don't know what the match is because you know when I'm editing it for the first time, I don't know what the outcome is. Um, yeah. And but then once I've edited it, I then send it. I send it in a folder to somebody else to then do the the casting and commentating. So it's all edited when the person casts it and commentated. As as you know, Cal, I used to yeah. edit a video. As I was surprised. I, I thought we were just gonna watch like raw footage, like an actual like cast, yeah. and I was like, oh, you put the cards up, sweet. <laughs> Yeah, all the cards are up, but um, you have to fo- still have to follow it along a little, a little bit. But yeah, try and make it easier for whoever's going to do that. But um, if you are going to do that, Bill, I cannot wait to 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 get that to get that raw file back from you and Jay because that'll be a fun one to do. Um, yeah, but, we're um, uh, planning on doing that tomorrow. We're going to hit up a local place called Hoagie Boys for uh, Hoagie Boys sandwiches. Yeah, sounds pretty good. Yeah. I'm getting hungry. I was say let's get to our arsenal stuff. I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, I have I have like two topics that I could talk about for the arsenal step. Um, I will talk about the one that's more applicable to most people watching this, and uh, that is just like there's a lot of video games that have come out recently that uh, I just really want to play, and yeah. I got back from uh, from casting Grand Archive uh, Nationals. It was a really good time. I I love casting. I'm going to be doing a lot more this year, um, but uh, got back and I was just like, okay, I want to, I want to buy the new Persona 3 remake. I want to buy the new, this is all uh, weeb stuff, by the way. So, you know, um, p- new Persona 3 remake, uh, the new Final Fantasy 7 game. I've heard that was a, is, is an absolute banger. Uh, I haven't played the first remake, so I'm going to buy the first remake and then play the second one. Um, what are the other ones? There's some other games too that are. That have just like are coming out or, or just came out that I really want to play. There's a lot. Um so I we'll see if I ever have the time for that. I've been playing I've still been playing a lot of uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, an incredible game. Um God, the 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 fights are insane. They're like they're like highest raid tier level fights. Like if you've played uh, like Final Fantasy Online or like World of Warcraft, man, the fights get nuts. Robin was watching me play and she's like, I don't understand how you know what's going on at all because at some point there's just like red all over the floor some of the red things are like pulsing like different colors there's like big old dragon shooting like laser beam fire there's another dude that the harder ones that have two bosses at the same time and there's like another dragon doing other crap and it's just just, just everywhere and i'm like <laughs> just like i'm just doing my best to not die here um <laughs> And it's, it's like, not uh, super forgiving, too. Like, even with, like, top-tier builds, you're going to die in, like, one or two hits. Um, so the game is, Brilliant. I think it's a lot of fun. Like, uh, so it's just, like, I've been doing that. Um, and you can do it by, you can do it with friends, right? It has up to four-player co-op. Uh, or you can just use the AI uh, companions. The AI companions, I will say, for, for Relink are very, very smart. They don't do a lot of damage because they really focus on not dying. But they will, like, perfect dodge almost everything. So... You can just suit up your AI companions and they'll help you out. Um, they won't do as much damage as like a human would, but you know they also won't die every like two seconds. So um, yeah, they're not they're not shit bag AI that just do absolutely nothing. They can actually help you in this game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll run up and do some attacks. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll help you out. It's it's a great game. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So that's my that's my arsenal step. Lots of uh, video games, uh, mostly weeb games. Um, there's a couple other ones coming out later this year. Ooh. I know this one. I know as is going to be stoked for this one later this month. Dragon's Dogma Two comes out, and dude, I'm so it comes out like on the twentieth. Yeah, um, oh God. and I love Dragon's Dogma, and I'm gonna play 
hundreds of hours into this one. Uh, I, I, I know I am. The first one, I used to be one of those people who would, if you play Dragon's Dogma, used to raid the Ur-Dragon at the end to get like the super rare Ur-Dragon drops. And I used to like wait for the Ur-Dragon, the timer, so I could fight and do the Ur-Dragon. So I'm I'm going to be... I'm going to be so, so into this, so yeah. Yeah, you'll have to let me um, let me have to let me use your your pawn as a as a character in my in my party. You have to do the same. Yeah, it's dude. not multiplayer. It's not multiplayer, is it? Still, it's still single player. I think it's single player. You just get other players' pawns. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's always great when like you have like a like a badass pawn, and then you like get your your buddies, and then like every so often you can check on them, and they they give you like a bunch of resources, and oh, it's great. That's such a cool game. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. What class I'm gonna play? I obviously tend to go for the rogue style. I, I played assassin in the first one a lot, but uh, maybe I'll try something different this time. Oh. Yeah, we'll see what they've got going on. Yeah, I, I hope I hope it has a uh, cross. A lot of games are doing this these days. I hope I hope it has like cross platform, um, like friending, because I'll probably be playing on PS5. I can probably make it work on my PC, but I just want to lay on the couch and play and play. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Any other Arsenal stuff stuff you guys got going on? Uh personally not really. Um, other than the uh league that means nothing casting that I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> um Fantastic. Building a commander deck. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah. I uh wanted something that I could play my my cool cards that I still own. Uh, and I was like humming and hawing back and forth a bunch of times. And then I was like, well, there was a deck that I used to play that just makes a bunch of, uh, tokens. It's uh gear ed conclave exile, which Classic. I would show you, but the only copy that I have is in Japanese. So it doesn't mean anything anyway. Um, at least not to me. So, um, it populates, it populates tokens, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah. 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 So the, the main idea behind it is just to play a bunch of cool stuff. And then I just recently picked up, uh, a uh, one of my grail cards for magic the gathering i've been looking for one of these for actually probably uh, i think eight years oh like, wow like, literally eight years uh it is a foil japanese Ooh. original kamigawa print kiki jiki no? oh yeah i recognize that immediately um, yeah I, I run kiki so, jiki in my uh, yeah. maelstrom wanderer deck yeah sweet yeah, so he's he's my favorite guy, and he makes tokens. And when you populate the tokens, uh, they don't have the sacrifice at end of turn clause that Kikijiki gives. So because of a weird way that populate works, I, um, I just like him because he kills uh, my opponents. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I always I always try to bake combo. in some sort of like two or three card combo just to end the game. Because bro, I'm not I'm not here to play commander for two hours. Um, oh yeah, if, if you let well, me I, I, uh, heart, defense of the heart into Kikijiki, then I'm doing it. That's it. <laughs> Shuffle up, play again. Yeah, yeah. This was the uh, this was the the commander at least that I played in that one stream that we did one time. And uh, you know, oh, it's a yeah. good target for Kiki, uh, Crater Hoof Behemoth. Oh, big uh, boy. Yeah, big, big boy. Big big, big stompies. Oh, you have a you have a nice ones. I just have regular boring like Avacyn restored uh, Crater Hoofs. You have like a foil. Is it Japanese or Chinese? This is foil Japanese, uh, Avison restored still. So nice. it's the original printing, uh, but the English Avison restored foils all look really weird. The, the, they um, have like a, Japanese they're like, they're like dark print. and ugly. I, yeah, they I, look like the, the, they're not great. The ink is on like an additional top layer. It looks like it's almost printed on like Saran wrap. It's weird. <laughs> I bought, I bought a few, including like a desolate lighthouse and some other ones for my cube and they look like balls. They, they don't look good. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, and one of the other reasons that I wanted to play this deck because obviously you make a bunch of tokens. So what makes uh, what makes tokens even better? Uh, doubling doubling season. season. Oh, so you have another nice doubling. one. Wow, that that, that yeah. he, he just showed off a like Japanese parallel foil lives. doubling season. Hey, I, I remember in Parallel Lives was like a two dollar card. Like no one gave a crap yeah, about it. It for, is not a two dollar card anymore. <laughs> yeah, that doubling season is probably worth like three hundred dollars. Oh wow! Hello. That's cool. <laughs> See, I have yeah. like I have a couple uh, copies of Doubling Season, but they're all just like basic, boring Doubling Seasons. This is, this is why uh, we've mentioned it a couple times on the podcast. Uh, as soon as Flesh and Blood makes Japanese cards that are like um, accessible uh, mm. or like Japanese versions of staples and stuff, I'm buying them because oh yeah, I me too. Japanese uh, Survival of the Fittest. Just looks I have epic, a foil man. Japanese. 
mana confluence like i love japanese cards and i want them i use. <laughs> i will not get out my cards this time because it'll take too long but yes i am i am with yeah. you some of my favorites include like uh i have, I have like a japanese avison um like the the original avison that gives all your things indestructible she's she's really cool i have a bunch of them i have a japanese uh my favorite are foreign black border uh cards so like your old uh foreign black border japanese versions so like i have a foreign black border like sylvan library and uh triskelion for my combo if for my my marin deck um and then of course you have your stuff like your uh your yoshitaka amano liliana dreadhorde general which is also no another one of my favorites um oh yeah yeah cool. good stuff oh, ju oh the uh, junji ito ones that they did uh getting those in japanese yeah, are really cool yeah good stuff um, but yeah if there's like japanese uh spring tunics or command and conquerors or whatever spring I'm tunic I'm east them. strike i mean like even east stuff so even like more like cheaper less expensive stuff i'm still gonna be really excited for like uh sink below give me some japanese sink below give me some japanese scar for scars right. all those are gonna go so hard um anything like japanese that has like cool ninja aesthetics or anything are gonna be like banger that like works. yeah like Absolutely. just just like a japanese ira like that would be sick as hell um japanese ira really really good yeah speaking of, uh, speaking of japanese in general one of my arsenal steps is watching a series called shogun on oh! uh, disney plus i've heard so um, so many people say it's good how are you liking it yeah yeah i've watched the first episode seems pretty cool um so uh, i think there i think there's two episodes on disney plus at the moment and they're releasing them weekly after that so yeah shogun um is something i'm watching currently is it uh, which uh i was gonna ask if it's based off the novel I don't know, actually. Okay, I'm not not entirely sure. Um, but um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's got a famous Japanese actor in it, but I can't remember what his name is. Ah, uh, what was his name? He was in John mm. Wick. He was also in. Oh, he's been in loads of things. The only for some reason the only actors that came to my mind there's uh, Yakusho Koji, who's one of my personal favorite Japanese actors, and there's like Ken Ken Watanabe. Uh, his name it's definitely not yakusha really koji if it was i'd be so so pogged and like to toshiro mifune he, the, he's that's old actor name he was in a lot of the kurosawa films there we go Hi hiroyuki sanada he's Ooh. been in loads of stuff he's been in loads of things um, is he the guy actually... that who's the who's he from john wick uh, he's the he's the the main guy that looks after the tokyo the tokyo um the tokyo hotel basically, mm -hmm. john wick mm -hmm. the, the tokyo continental he looks after that basically okay um but yeah he was in the last samurai he was in avengers endgame as one of the one of the japanese uh guys that hawkeye as ronin is hunting down during endgame uh he was in that he's been in loads of different things yeah nice massive actor for japan uh yeah so i've been watching that and um also uh i did watch the original june film um <laughs> the, uh, the, half, half the when i watched it the david lynch one no no no, no. so not the original one the the first one of oh them. okay i'm like i'm like oh because like <laughs> that's what i'm like considered to be one of the worst movies of all time and one of my yeah. only interactions with dune uh, as a as a franchise uh, or as a property was i watched i've watched like a bits and pieces of the one the kyle mclaughlin david lynch dune and it's like so so bad um, apparently yeah apparently it's not it's not great but um yeah there's obviously june 2 from uh from dennis villanueve i can't pronounce his name very well uh his his um his movie is out now so mm -hmm. i want to watch the first one and then the yeah, second one me too because i was half it's... i was half asleep when i watched the first one when i when i want to try doing that it's this it's the same with final fantasy 7 remake i like i want to i want to partake in the second piece but i haven't yeah. like watched the first one so yeah because i, I, I want to watch dune as well i hear it's like really good and i'm just like i just haven't had time to get around to it and yeah same but um and then apart from that game related but before we before we close it off for today, yeah, um, I watch a lot of uh, Angry Joe show, which is a YouTube oh my channel. god, that's a blast from the past! Holy hell, uh, dude! I have not yeah. watched Angry Joe since like since college, like since he was in like Channel Awesome or whatever. Like he's still he's, he's still going, and he just cracks me up. He just gets so 
peed off at certain things, but he's got a completely valid point, completely valid points for it. Like all these games are just absolute trash. They're money grabbing, loot boxes, and all this. It just cracks me up. Uh, but maybe that's just British sense of humor. I don't know. But yeah, he was he was um, he did a short review on a game called Hell Divers Two recently. Oh yeah. That, oh yeah, everyone's playing that and game that right game. now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's one game I've. I think I might have to try because I absolutely love Starship Troopers, and everyone's saying it's giving off those sorts of oh, vibes. Oh yeah, a million percent. With your mates and just blow blow up bugs, basically. So uh, I very, I very I read a tweet from like one of the main devs for Hell Divers Two, and uh, someone was like, "Oh, how do you feel like?" A lot of people are now going and rewatching Starship Troopers because of your game, and he's like, "No, that's great! Like he he loves that." Um, and I'm like, "It makes a lot of sense. They basically just made like the best Starship Troopers game ever." Um, I feel like Helldivers Two is the game that I personally wouldn't get a lot of out of like right now, but it, in college I would have loved it so much. Like when I had like a group of friends to play with, like every like other day, it would have been like so good. But now for me now, it just me be me playing by myself because my time my scheduling is just so bad with stuff i just play at random times and so i, I would yeah yeah I, i'd probably play it for like a couple hours and then be like that's fun and then just like never played never play it again um which is why i'm like you know i'm excited about persona 3 because i can just play that whenever i have time for the next six months i guess um yeah I mean, yeah. it's that, that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. That's what's held me back on the purchase is, you know, I imagine it would be absolutely sick if you could get three people or four people or whatever to get in a party and play consistently. But is that going to happen at our, at our advanced ages when we've got a lot of schedules going on? It's... That's why single player games are good, right? Because we can just pick up and play whenever. It's like that. And then also, like, a lot of my friends are just, like, not in the same time zone anymore. Like like true yeah as I mean, bill look what we're doing now <laughs> yeah exactly it's like i do have friends like local friends but they're also like insanely busy right it's not like i'm gonna like dm prof and be like yeah. hey you want to play hell divers too um <laughs> that's not, like yeah. like not gonna happen so um or even like my yeah. brother like who who also lives locally it's just i don't know it's just part of it's part of like getting older i guess yeah, time just gets away from you, doesn't it? Which is why it's just it's just nice to spend time every week speaking to you guys on the yeah. podcast, whether, whether it's flesh and blood related or not. We go on wild tangents and speak about random stuff, but <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I was speaking to I was speaking to Logan uh, from Flesh and Pod, Logan mm. Peterson. On mm -hmm. was it Logan Peterson? I think so. Thank you. I think so. But yeah, we met in um we met in Hartford and we were out on a night out and you know he said something quite profound. He's a very intelligent guy. He said something quite profound to me on when we were drunk and he said the best the best thing you can ever you can give anybody is your time, right? Yeah. So because that's because that's one thing you're never going to get back ever is time. So everybody that listens to our podcast, every, everyone that you know tunes into our videos, you're giving us your time. So that is, you know, obviously the most valuable thing that you can give us. And obviously, we're all giving each other now, you know, every single week, each other's time. So it's just one of those things that's very profound, and it's stuck with me for a while because we're never going to get those moments back. And it is nice to to spend it with people that are just good people, really. So I just yeah, I agree. I think it's more true. The older you get as well, right? Because more and yeah. more of your time is taken by obligations, either, you know, family obligations, work obligations. And so your time becomes more and more limited. And so, like, what you do with your time is very important. And budgeting your time is, is great. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. And this podcast, honestly, is like my one anchor to, like, fle like to, to flesh and blood the last few weeks, right? I've been so busy with other stuff is like, this is my one thing right so always have this to look forward to at least which i'm probably I'm, a lot of people's very well. thankful for probably a lot of people's anchor is uh is our podcast specifically there's going to be there's going to be a lot of people that listen to other things as well but you know there's, there's, there's a quite a few people that i imagine would like to listen to us specifically you know every week so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do that for you as well so thanks for spending your time with us yeah even, even if it's like a time double dip like i like to do is like so my my time double dip it used to be like when i would be um taking the bus or whatever the driving to work i would have like podcasts yeah. playing when i worked as a baker i would also have 
like podcast playing these days i don't do that so my my double dip now is when i'm taking a shower uh i will have my phone and i'll put a podcast on and set it like on the counter and i'll be listening to the podcast while i'm in the shower that's that's kind of how i like maximize my <laughs> maximize my time these days so if that's, that's what right. you're doing for us yo if only Chris Broad knew that I was listening to him while I was washing my body. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he, probably, he probably just assumes, or I think anyone who who does like podcasts and stuff, like just just, just assumes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, or if like, but, uh, I'll I'll turn on. Uh, we, Robin and I've been watching a lot of like YouTube on 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 the, through the PS5 on the TV, and so when I wake up in the morning and I'm making like breakfast or coffee, I'll I'll do that. I'll I'll toss up like like who's got a video early in the morning. All right, I'll talk. I'll throw up Prof's video talking about Secret Layer or whatever. I'll just, I'll just throw it up and listen to that while I uh, while I make food. So, um, yeah. if if we're that for you, if yeah. we're if we're the background, you know, noise to your life, then that's great. Like, yeah, yeah. I think as well as that, as you know, podcasts are great because obviously it gets people it gets people to know who we are really on a sort of on a sort of that basis. And again, you know, as you say, you know, you're just throwing up Prof's video because he's brought one out and you like him as a person. I do exactly the same. I just put a video on because I like the person that's in it. And that's another thing about content creation. Just being in the sphere is if you like someone, you'll just watch their videos because they're in it. Like Pleasant Kenobi today did a video on Commander is now magic, basically. And I was he's like, not wrong. Oh, yeah, I'll put that video <laughs> on. Yeah. 20 minute video of him just speaking about you know stuff um but yeah that's another thing that with, you know with content is you know people, people like you they'll watch the videos regardless of what you do i guess in some degree but um but yeah if you continue to like us then continue to listen to our our podcast too that'd be great cheers yeah yeah we appreciate you thank you for being here um yeah that's a, that's a good that's a good note to to leave on so um I guess uh, we'll wrap it on, <laughs> wrap it on up here. Uh, yeah. Thank you all once again for being here and listening. Uh, I'm Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue. You can find me everywhere at the thing down below, or if you're, I guess, if you're audio only, um, at Red Zone Rogue. And um, Bill, where can everyone find you? Uh, well, I am Bill from the Spike Feeders. Uh, you can find me on uh, social media at Bill TSF. You can also find me on YouTube at the Spike Feeders Fab, where we do live edited gameplay content. You should definitely go check that out if that's something that interests you. I am also going to be featuring, as mentioned, uh, by As on mm. his channel. Uh, I'm going to be doing some uh, some commentary on the League mm -hmm. That Means Nothing videos. Um, Absolutely. So you should definitely go check those out, too, because it's going to be a great time. And As uh, is a good tournament organizer. Uh, that is the one is. thing that I've always said about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah to if it's just anything you know about as is you're just really good at organizing tournaments yeah hey man <laughs> hey maybe maybe that's like your path to in the future right maybe you're just going to become like uk's premier to for flesh and blood right maybe yeah. that's right yeah Hell well yeah. if anybody's listening to this and they want me to organize a tournament for you i can do it and i can stream it i can produce it i can do all of that you know mm. i'm no man i'm no man sant but I can I can definitely uh, I can definitely do some stuff with regards to organizing. I'm quite an organized person, despite the chaos and the drinking and the late night partying. <laughs> I'm actually quite organized uh, under all of that, believe it or not. Uh, I, I yeah, that tracks. It tracks. Yeah, chaos I, I, and harmony all encompassed in a mullet wearing glasses person. Well, Mister Glasses yeah. Mullet Person, where can people find you? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, as from Going and Gaming, so yeah, Going and Gaming on YouTube, and then uh, Going and Gaming AZ on uh, Twitter is where uh, the, the social platform I use the most at the moment. Um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to speaking to you guys again very, very soon, and listeners, viewers, wherever you might be out there listening to this, thanks for giving us your time, as we mentioned earlier. It mm -hmm. means a lot to us, and um, that's pretty much it, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, that's going to be it for this uh, week's episode. We'll be back next week for some more, uh, you know, chatting about Flesh and Blood. I've, I've been trying to think about uh, other, you know, ways to spice up uh, some episodes. Like, we are going to have some downtime waiting for um, waiting for Part the Mist Veil, so stay tuned for that. I'm, I've been thinking about maybe asking some other Flesh and Blood devs to get on and just kind of chat, chat about uh, their journey. Um the old uh, session blood dudes are, are really cool, so maybe getting Carol or Kieran on would be would be great. So, yeah, 
Um, that's some of the stuff I've been thinking about. Let us know down below if you have any other cool ideas, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Absolutely. See you folks. Bye. All right. That's a, that's a wrap, gentlemen.